I'm opening. We have an eye, sort of a nostril, two teeth. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menunos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Movie. We are here doing Rio 2 animated feature film this year. I think this is the first fully featured movie that we're discussing. I mean, I think going back, we did Nightmare Before Christmas, but that was all stop motion animation. Mm-hmm. I think this is the first real all 3D animation that we're talking about. That we talked about. Yeah, we, did, we skipped. We didn't talk about Frozen. So no, we're we swimming right to sure. Rio 2. Um, I'm very excited. Hi guys, Sarah Stratton here. Um, oh, getting excited yeah, for the song that's great, coming great out. Music. <laughs> and hey, hello everyone, I'm Mercy Serafini, and we also have someone new with us joining today. Hey guys, it's Chloe West. Chloe West, and welcome to the panel. This Thank be you. Fun having a new perspective uh, joining us because usually it's Sarah and me when it's just a girls, uh, <laughs> girls discussion. <laughs> but we have a full female panel today, and also we have. The wonderful executive producer, Phil Svitek, in the booth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Ooh. Phil did not see this movie. <laughs> He's but scared of birds. He should. Maybe, maybe he is. Highly scared of birds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. What were your overall thoughts of this movie? Did you enjoy it? Did you see real one? Did, like, Were you a big fan of the first one before you saw this one? I was definitely on board for Rio, um, the original picture. And so I was excited for them to come out with this one. I think that it was bright, it was loud, it was festive. Um, and on all of those, it, it it did really well. I thought it was a very big celebration um, in the in the Amazon. And it, it keeps moving. It's very fast paced. I think that for a young animated feature, it does really well. Yeah, I think the first Rio was great. It sort of brought you back to the classic animated films that have music and have a big storyline and, you know, really brought you to Rio. And I think the animation itself with just all of the characters, you really felt like you were in Rio. You felt that atmosphere. And then the second one, taking you into the Amazon, I think did the same thing with the colors and all of the storyline and the music really made you feel like oh my gosh this is so fun I'm having so much fun it's moving so fast it's an hour and 40 minutes but it did not feel like that at all and we're in the Amazon and it it felt a little old school to me which I really enjoyed about it it's very very vibrant if I had described row two in one word it would be yeah. vibrancy I would say definitely vibrant I loved the first movie Rio and I was so excited when I knew that they were gonna do the second movie I was like I'm gonna be there in the movie theaters first second day whenever I can get to it so and then me just being a general fan of music and having and even like incorporating music into animals and seeing how they you know portray them Mm -hmm. personify that that humans usually do I thought it was really fun I thought this movie it had great visual aspects color and all the different animals and then we had the humanistic character storyline as mm-hmm. well integrated uh, overall. I thought it was really fun. They definitely stepped it up to a whole new level from the first movie. This felt like a grand, more grand, and a, and a brighter uh, location as well. Because mm-hmm. Rio, you have a big, beautiful city. And now you have Amazon, which is a big, beautiful, crazy jungle. So, And I thought they, uh, we had that feel throughout the whole movie. I think one of my favorite components to Rio 1 and Rio 2 is just the ability of the animators to not only capture this vibrant sound culture that's very much, you know, samba-based, Brazilian-based, but also they capture a movement because I think that that's Mm -hmm. very prominent Mm -hmm. in this style of music where it's not as much about 
the like what someone's singing or what someone's saying it's really about the feel it's getting up and dancing and i just remember in real one having the the carnival parade and everyone's shaking and they captured that again in this with the flight of the birds and how they did all of the movement characterization in the animation adds to the soundtrack absolutely i really enjoyed that the types of dance that brazil and south america have that are and then brazil specifically there's many more than just samba for types of dance that are unique to that culture. And one thing I loved is in the audition sequence in Rio 2, you saw a lot of the types of dance that Brazil has, and it was great. I mean, the turtles doing capoeira was like one of my favorite parts. (laughs) And it's just really cool that this animated film could teach you so much, even when they were flying to the Amazon. You know, you were really seeing all these amazing parts of Rio that I've never been to Rio and you've seen pictures, but now it's like, I feel like if I were to go to Rio, the animation was done so well that I would be able to pick out those spots that mm-hmm. we've seen in this movie, which is so great because when your title is Rio, you know, you really have to hold strong to showing the city as it is and really opening it up to a whole new audience in America. And it starts off with a New Year's celebration, which is exactly what they do in Rio. Everyone dresses in white. Everyone pushes, you know, their offerings of the new year into the ocean. Everybody's on the beach. That is something extremely unique to Rio. Um, And I just think it's amazing that they were able to show two very distinct celebrations from Carnival to the new year in these two films it's Mm -hmm. so great it's such it's so well done it's all the little things that i think made this movie what it is and and i'm glad you brought up the the new year's celebration because that was another way how they helped promoted this film at the 2004 new year's uh new year's eve celebration at the copacabana beach Mm -hmm. they they really um promoted rio down in um Oh, in, very in cool. Mm-hmm. For, for this year. Um, so I want to get into the, the inception and the development. We know this is the sequel movie, but because the first one was so uh, well-received and they had talked, uh, the, the director, Carlos Saldana, and um, the pr- music producer that we, um, Sergio Mendez, who also worked on the music for the first film, they early talks back in 2012 the first movie came out in 2011 but already back in 2012 they were mm-hmm. talking about sequels and having that in the works in january 2012 i believe and then uh, we slowly got everyone back on board and blue sky this is the first sequel that blue sky has done outside of the ice age franchise mm-hmm. which i think is great because Blue Sky really boomed with the Ice Age. We got one, two, three, four movies. I yeah, think, Ice Age, and so to start a whole nother franchise that people can look forward mm-hmm. to, I think is really great. And they have talked about continuations for Rio, um, in development. And I know even now they're talking about a Rio three. And even before the wide release of Rio two, they were already considering multiple storylines because the directors felt that there's many places he has so many more stories to tell. And he has fallen in love with these birds and this culture. So it did come into inception fairly quickly. Um, unfortunately, this was the last script, I believe, Don Reimer was Don Reimer. R- r- fill, um, either fully competed or was writing on before he passed away. So I think that that really touches the heart. But it's great that they are still wanting to continue and they still have a love of this setting. Yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think they have so many stories they could tell. Mm-hmm. You know, these birds can go anywhere. And thinking about the Ice Age franchise that has come about, I mean, they've gone from the Ice Age, you know, to they've just, they're just continuing to tell history through these characters. And I think you can continue to tell stories in South American stories and even historical things about South America through these characters Mm -hmm. because they're so different and there's so many that everybody can latch on to and enjoy. And the music is so great that you can continue to write. I think you absolutely could have a huge Rio franchise. I think the hardest part about about these films is they are they keep adding on so many characters. Mm-hmm. And all the characters have very distinct po- personalities, which you have to give them so much credit for. It's because literally they're just identifiable in how they look, how they talk, how they sing, how they move. And they're so, they're so bright. And I don't know how to describe it, but they're so 
distinct in each of their personalities. Um, the hard part is that we get connected to them in a film, and as you grow in a franchise, you have to be able to kind of let some go. Yeah. And they've just, they've created this ensemble, and it is because, like, there's a huge flock of birds, they have all their different people that they need, whether it's the villains, the enemies, or, like, you know, they're, like, they're, they're posse, their, yeah. like, support <laughs> system. And because there's, these characters are so distinct, the audience wants them to be there. But I think for plot development, you have to be able to be like, oh, these people are doing this somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so for Rio 3, I think if you add, it's like, if you just keep adding, you can't add all the birds in the Amazon. That'll just be very difficult to manage. Yeah, they'll have to leave some back in Rio. Mm -hmm. They'll have to, you know, see some of the characters that we love in maybe the first scene. But then once the plot really kicks in, once we really see the challenges that the heroes are going to have to go through... They're going to need to leave some birds and some mm -hmm. other animals back in Rio so that we can all connect to the new story that's happening, the new villain, exactly. you know, the new plot twist, whatever it's going to be. It needs to it needs to definitely cut it down. Yeah. And also when you bring new characters into a story, people from general storytelling, people are going to want that character arc. Mm -hmm. And I felt like we had, again, another character arc within Blue, the main Spix Blue Macaw and Jewel more so Jewel in this movie than the first mm -hmm. time because first one Jewel was a very tough girl one already had an established personality mm -hmm. and when she she knew her place it was just about getting back to, out into the open mm -hmm. for the first film and then the second one is now finding her family which adds more layers to her character mm -hmm. as well and then blue we see from the first already domesticated and again in the second one still domesticated <laughs> but now being integrated into the jungle and going back to mm -hmm. his roots i found that was another character development arc yeah it was definitely the main people. it was definitely fleshing out their relationship and also mm -hmm. their marriage like i'm glad that they didn't make it everything is happy like mm -hmm. they did add this dynamic and i think a very real situation where you're bringing in the in-laws you're bringing in that people can or birds can want different environments and where compromises come relationships that i like and now it's exciting because they they have so many other characters that they can flesh out and can't give arcs to which is like I think that where you have to go from this is I want to know more about the arcs of their kids, about the arcs yeah. of their friends, yes, 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 because they have a very, I guess, fulfilled relationship to me. Uh, I think, and I loved how they did build this mm -hmm. blue f macaw family, because yes. in the first one, we realized that it's an extinct breed, and then mm -hmm. we're led to believe that Jewel and blue are the only two blue macaws out there. But now knowing that there is a whole, well, a more smaller but population out there, that it, there are other birds that they can flourish with them as well. I think that adds another layer to them that they can grow in, in a community. Mm -hmm. To be honest, the way Rio 2 felt to me, and if they were to continue, I think they should continue it as a TV show. Because there are so many characters, like we're saying, to fit it all into a movie is really tough. But they have all these distinct characters. And I would love to see episodes where, mm -hmm. you know, the oldest daughter, you know, she's so sassy. She's such a teenager. It was so great to see that as a bird and as her really getting excited when Blue's friends were coming because then she could get involved. Mm -hmm. She could get involved and do something fun that she liked. You know, I think these characters, because we know so much about each one of them, it's hard to try and give them that character arc in just a movie. But I think in a TV show, you could really, like, every episode could be featuring a different character. I think it would be a wonderful character. TV show. Yeah, it would totally be really great. It. And you could really have all the characters coming in, you know, for certain episodes and not in for others. But they would always, always be there because... You know, looking at or Blue's web stories. Or web series. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, looking at Blue's storyline, you know, you needed his friends. He needed that encouragement, you know, the from them telling him, you know, to let loose and let go or that a happy wife makes a happy marriage and a happy life. And, mm -hmm. you know, he needed those things for his character to be able to find the courage to do what he wanted to do to save the rainforest. But I don't know how they're going to have all of them in the third one. That yeah, would be it, a lot. It's great that you mentioned that they, they should have maybe a TV series. And in an interview, Jamie Foxx and Will I Am, uh, they mentioned that they would love to see maybe a spinoff mm -hmm. of just Nico mm -hmm. and Pedro. Because those two 
characters, the canary and the cardinal, they're really fun comedic characters within mm-hmm. this movie. And with Louise. And, I love all yes, of them. And they're they're great friends and we know that they they have great chemistry together. They're fun. They play off of each other. But I want to know like how they met. Mm-hmm. And, like what makes them that great partnership. Just the there's some fun side stories as well. I think that would be an awesome spin-off and I think yeah, I think the audience would love to see that. I think there's so much opportunity in these characters because each character has adds comedy to this film. Mm-hmm. Like it's not narrowed down into just oh these are your funny guys every single character is bringing comedy yes. whether it's blue's awkwardness whether it's <laughs> they're like playing off each other and like him finding a different hat whether it's the the birds having teenage characteristics of being sassy or of being a little bit more nerdy or one that's getting into trouble it's like the comedy is firing all the time in rio 2 and it's coming from every angle it's coming from the humans it's coming from the birds it's coming from the father who's like the military bird and yeah (laughs) it's coming from every single character like even your villains even Mm. your villains are providing comedic relief and that's the human with his lollipop with his terrorizing monkey friend big boss exactly (laughs) or or the return of the villains from the past and you've got christian channel with playing a poisonous frog poison (laughs) dart like there's just continuous comedy in all different types, whether it's like slapstick, physical, like what they're saying. So that was one of my favorite highlights about this. Just there's so many jokes and it's so fun. And even you can connect even to the villains, mm-hmm. especially with the animal villains. Mm-hmm. When we talked about the poisonous frog and, you know, the, the villain. Cockatoo. Yeah, the villain and from Nigel. the first Nigel. one coming back and. You seeing his character arc of this performer that they touched on in the first Rio, but really coming to life in this one. And it was so amusing. It was great to see. Uh, but I just don't necessarily, I hope if they make another one that Nigel is is done forever. He <laughs> doesn't miraculously come back again. That he has the power of flight once again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I I agree with bringing because this is a family film and kids are going to watch it. I feel when you have so many people, kids aren't going to pay attention and they're going to lose interest because they're not going to follow along. It's going to get too complicated for them. Mm -hmm. And I think they did a great job of balancing an Mm -hmm. ensemble cast. And yes, we had to, when you bring new people in, you're going to have to say goodbye to other people. From like the first one we had, we had to say goodbye to Fernando. But we did see him at the beginning of the movie. He was more mature. Sure. You can just give people and, cameos. Yeah, cameos. I felt like Louise and um, yes, the and the dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, the you know they had their funny moments, but they were only maybe in two, three scenes. So uh, those characters who were more well developed than the first one, we we did get to see them in the second mm-hmm. one, but not as much. So you have to you know pick and choose which ones you want to keep. Mm-hmm. And I think. Uh, you know, you know, let's get into the cast of this movie. Humongous ensemble. I mean, so many names. <laughs> so so many. many names on this list of voiceover. I just feel like I understand that typically in voiceover work, you're not always, you know, communicating with somebody you actually have a scene with. You have to communicate yeah. with animators. You have to meet you're watching a screen. You have to match your mouth. Like, there's so many things that these people have to do. But how many people they got to sign on and sign on again, bring again. Jesse Eisenberg back, um, and, and then bring Hathaway, Jermaine, and then bringing in people and like Andy Garcia and all over the Kristen board, Chenoweth. Kristen Chenoweth, Kristen Chenoweth, Rita Moreno, and coming yeah. from, coming from Broadway, Bruno coming from Mars. music, coming all from over, pop music, yeah, coming everywhere. from serious actors, like just what a fun ensemble for the animators to work with. And I think it also goes to show just the talent of the actors Mm -hmm. themselves because Mm -hmm. this is an animated feature. A lot of times you're not going to really be that one-on-one in person where Mm -hmm. you can play off of each other in acting scenes. This is the talent of their voice acting Mm -hmm. as well rather than physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an interview where Anne Hathaway said, because her character Blue interacts with uh, her longtime friend, um... Roberto? Roberto. 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 Yeah. But they have a lot of scenes together. But Anne Hathaway has, hasn't met Bruno Mars and still hasn't to this day. Oh. So I found it really fun how they have to, just that knowledge of um, recording their voices, but putting them together and seeing mm-hmm. as if they have met, but in real life they haven't. 
Interesting. What I think made this f- film, this film franchise, work so well was the fact that they did use, you know, it's a musical film and they used musicians from Broadway and from pop music and even Anne Hathaway who can sing and we know that. And what's great is compared to older animated films like The Little Mermaid, for example, or Beauty and the Beast, the people who did the voice weren't doing the singing as well. So it's so great and what I think worked so well for this and probably made the animators' lives a little bit easier was that these people doing the voices also can sing. So they were also doing their singing parts. And it makes a difference. And I think you really see it in Kristen Chenoweth's character that she was able to improv some of her lines as singing, even though they weren't necessarily a song. But it adds to her character. Because if her character's going to break out in song, I'm sure she's going to break out a few words in song. And I mean, I know I do that anyways. You know, you'll- And if you know Kristen Chenoweth, and you, if you ever watch her just give like a speech or yeah. anything, there's always some sing song coming. Absolutely. Coming and so I think that's great. Mm-hmm. I think it added to each of the characters and you can add more jokes in. And I think the best example of that is Robin Williams when he did the genie in Aladdin. He was really able to bring the genie to life more than just saying the lines in a character. You know, he was able to improv and make everything happen. And then the animators can work with all that. You know, so it's this great collaboration. And I think that's what helps to make Rio such a great film. And Rio 2 especially with all of these artists like Will I Am being able to just have his character bust out a rap whenever possible. And you don't have to stop the You're voiceover. You're not worrying about limitations. Mm-hmm. Like if it's all encapsulated it's by one artist, then they have the flexibility to just work with you. And you're not having to have middlemen or transitions yeah. or work between you know, making the voice blended is one voice. Yeah, which is so rare, actually, and just really special to this film. And the great thing about this film is that the director, Carlos, he he allowed the actor, his talent, to really add their own personality and their take on their um, characters Mm -hmm. that they portrayed. Uh, One in particular, Bruno Mars, a great performer, as we all know, that his character, Roberto, they, they had already animated him. Mm. The, the 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 mm. uh the bird and when a uh, car crawlers fell in love with bruno when he saw bruno perform on snl and then immediately wanted him to jump on board and sign him and but so when bruno went to go film his his um lines and singing parts that he found out that because roberta's character was supposed to be originally more macho uh, more macho kind of gentleman and now with Bruno's personality, he was more hip hop kind of. They like, readjusted. More suave. They readjusted. Definitely yes. suave. More, yeah, m- definitely more suave kind of characteristic that they even reanimated mm-hmm. Roberto to fit Bruno Mars's personality and voice that he brought to the character, which I thought that was amazing. And then going back to to Blue, uh, more you know that the straight up, very. I shouldn't say stoic, but uh, very set in his ways kind of character. And then uh, we saw at the end of Real One that he got back into the music and was singing. And now we see Blue singing a little bit more in this yeah. in this movie and dancing more, accepting more of his attempting. original. Attempting. Yes, <laughs> attempting. But accepting his culture and his background. I never think Blue is, a f- is not wanting to accept anything or not wanting to change. I think what's special about Blue is that he's scared. And that's what people can relate to is that fear of change and that fear of something different and the fear of going away from what you're comfortable from. And I think that's such a great theme because I think everybody, you know, really feels that in one way or another. And having the loved ones as the example of, no, it's okay. And like the things you're good at, you're good at. And that's awesome because we can use those too. But try this new cool thing. I it, it is it's Blue's character and it's so fun and it it goes back to Real One where there's so much symbolism in the fact that you have the character of Blue who's a complete overthinker, yeah, unwilling to just take the leap and fly. It's the calculations. It's like oh well, is this really supposed to work? <laughs> and like in this one, he is embracing that. You know, he's flying around, but it's still still the overthinking. It's still carrying yeah. around the fanny Tail pack. Tail, It's yeah. It's the checklist. Yeah. And, 
and the but GPS. That, and but also it makes him endearing because he yeah. does care so much and he's thinking so much yeah. to try and make it work. And you do see his character develop more in this movie because at the beginning of the film, you see he is still very domesticated, <laughs> making human pancakes. I so love that. <laughs> those human, humanistic qualities that us, the audience who are actually watching, can relate to and mm-hmm. find the humor in that. And then, but throughout when they're traveling into the Amazon, Amazon forest, and then we can see him slowly lose the human mm-hmm. tools that he's using: the GPS, the the fanny, pack, the toothbrush, the toothbrush, <laughs> the the electric toothbrush, which I thought was hysterical. But we see him slowly getting away from the human and mm-hmm. accepting the animalistic, natural side of him. Yeah. Did you guys feel? Though, throughout the entire theme of the film, I think a lot of it is, yeah, like going back to your roots and getting back to nature. But did anybody feel a Fern Gully type of feel? I wrote feel? Fern Gully now. You did? Yes. Yeah, it was very Fern Gully in the way the bad guys looked and the similar images of all the trees falling and just trying to protect everything and, you know, getting back to nature. And I do love that theme. Don't get me wrong. Fern Gully is one of my favorites. But... Uh, I just would hope that if they were to make a Rio 3, they would come up with new sort of themes. Mm -hmm. I do think the environmental theme is still very big, but almost maybe in a different storyline. It was just that storyline specifically, you know, the birds versus the humans Mm -hmm. in a way of them being loggers and them cutting down the rainforest, I think is a little bit overplayed. Um, And we've seen it done in Ferngully and then even in Avatar, you know, it was like a very similar. I was, mine. I was like, it's Avatar, kind of. Yeah, and Avatar kept getting and compared to Fern to Gully and Pocahontas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many that I think what was so great about Rio One was it was its own storyline. It was brand new, and then with Rio Two going to the Amazon, we sort of just it was almost easy. Well, I you, felt. I agree that you know we have seen it before, but I do think that it's a good point because that was one of the director's motivations is that he really wanted the environmental side of the deforestation Mm. to be at the forefront of one of his films as a message. Because although we've seen it before, it's still a big concern. And it's not something that's very changed. And we're like, we've seen Ferngully. I think that the kids who are going to watch this, a lot of them haven't. So it is reintroducing that topic for the next generation. Mm. Because you know what? Ours hasn't quite fixed it. Yeah. so (laughs) It's a good point. It's, you know, it's keep pushing it to get other people to try it because someone eventually has to step up and do it so i think it comes more from that and since he set out there to make that a point i'm glad that we're we're talking about it yeah because it did resonate it did come through you weren't just thinking about the themes about family the themes about home you were also it was very obvious that there was this other big problem coming on and that people had to join together whatever their circumstances to fight it um so that i really liked i was like the person who, to me, is the most kind in this film has to be Linda. I mean, Linda's just willing to move wherever. Where I know. I feel Tulio? bad for her. Tulio, I'm sorry. He drives me crazy. I don't know how Linda <laughs> does it. I think that Tulio just is a little selfish. You see it. And, like, Linda's doing all the work and all this, all these things for him. And she loves him. And Tulio's just kind of in his own little Tulio world. But uh, again, yes, I think, but that makes them a fun pairing Mm -hmm. because Linda is that kind of thinking of everyone else Mm -hmm. and always caring about animals Mm -hmm. and the respect for that. And then we have Tulu, just the fascination and wanting to keep that animal kingdom going and thriving to have both of them work together. I thought was a really fun pairing. I just want everyone to save Linda. They are married in this movie. They they're, are? They're married now. Mm-hmm. Oh, so I would have liked to see them get married. The little bluebirds putting the rings on their fingers for them. That yeah. would have been nice. But um, I don't know. I do. I just think either get rid of Tulio, you know, don't have him in the next storyline. No, he just needs to redeem himself. Or be yeah. more developed in a way than just being the same joke over and over again. Because I'm very annoyed with his character. <laughs> I, I agree. I just want them. I think that. We've seen Blue get saved. We <laughs> now have seen, you know, they found their family in the rainforest. Their whole race has the survival. And, like, Linda is that wonderful, caring person who's literally just followed him to the ends of the earth. Yeah. She's followed him from the U.S. to another country. And now from this other country 
to the middle of the rainforest. <laughs> and so I think that I'm just like, you go, Linda. But, like, someone needs to stick up for her. Like, mm. they need to embrace her kind of as the family they always refer to. I you think know? so, like, too. Like, she... Give her some credit. Give her some love. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, but the great thing about Tulio and Linda, because they aren't as strong as characters as we'd like them to be, but they still do make out to be the hero mm-hmm. people in this film because they're the ones who are really the ones who can save the humans. I mean, birds, we, we see the story of near the end in the movie where the birds, you know, work together to work against mm-hmm. the humans, but it's really the human interaction against other humans mm-hmm. and that they use their power for the betterment and for the good of the the macaw kingdom Mm -hmm. (laughs) maybe if it was a tv show they could make it like wild thornberries where they were like living in the jungle the whole time and interacting with them in that way i wouldn't mind that having their bird voices yeah having little jungle children (laughs) yeah so because they again they aren't the strongest they Mm -hmm. still do come out on top yeah and they do they do have a redeeming quality too yeah and they give some the the movie some of its heart yeah and some of its greatest moments like towards the end this is skipping forward a little bit on linda but where she is the one who takes the battle of the tractors yeah. against mm-hmm. each other and she's fighting over this bird like not only verbally but physically the one standing up i thought those are nice little tidbits that we get yeah i want to get into jewel's family because mm-hmm. we we learn in this movie that there are more mac- blue macaws out there and there's hope for jewel to find other people just mm-hmm. like her and we do find her family and we find her father her her aunt her her yes. fun aunt mimi and and then bring them all together i'm like this is just a regular human family that so many people can relate to absolutely i loved the scene when her aunt was chatting with everybody and no one really was understanding what was happening and she just you know leans over to blue and is like just go with it you know it was so natural and so humanistic and i think everyone in the theater could relate and kind of laugh along and be like oh i got that aunt you know i think the addition of all their characters was very well like i thought that the the childhood friends slash romance yeah. and the aunt and the dad were all fun and as you said relatable the one scene that i was like took me by surprise was then when they did discover that it was father daughter and it was like share of a monologue mm-hmm. where it was split lines where it was just that back and forth and i was like i was like whoa i'm I was like, that came out of nowhere quick. But I was like, oh, but now they're a happy family. So at least we've got that settled. What was weird about that monologue for me was I wasn't sure if they were ex-lovers or if it was father-daughter until they said it at the end because it was so bizarre. It wasn't, you know, it was it was a little too close. It was kind of, it was just bizarre. I can't really think of any other way to describe it. Because it came very abruptly. It came abruptly and you sort of knew that they were going to play some relationship thing because her and Blue are so different. You kind of felt that coming, but you didn't know if it was going to come right then and there. And then it was her dad's. So then you're like, okay. It was just bizarre. But did anybody else, or I, because we're all girls here, I'm a little annoyed that another animated film has the lead girl not having a mother. Yeah, I was it's, just going to Yeah, it's that. like adding to that sort of theme, which I don't think you necessarily need anymore. And I'm just wondering why they chose to do that here, too. I think it also goes to show that Jewel, because she didn't have that mother, she had that strong father and um, military and kind of upbringing that also aided to her survival skills and how she... No, how she, you, so you're saying if you have a mother, you're not going to no, be strong no, no. and survive? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that helped her be that strong, independent woman that she grew up to be. No, I think what I it does. I think what it does is it. I think that orphans have often played a big part in animation. Mm-hmm. I think that in this film in particular, there is unless you make it where it's the matriarch has all the power, it's a lot easier to have like a domineering father who's going to train the new son and the son. And if you're looking at for the opposite of blue, like you're going, to, that's what you need to play. The, the parent foil. needs to be the opposite of Blue. I think it was and Blue is foil. the one who overthinks and is very kind and very giving and like a little bit frantic. 
And so the opposite is someone who's very stern, very strict. Very someone instinctual. Who, exactly. And that, just with gender stereotypes, tends to be a more male-dominated role. And to set up a mother in that position, I think, takes more exposition. I don't it think you necessarily more, like, need a mother. I just think it was... You know, you don't need a mother to be that role, but it would just be interesting to push the writers to write both parents. Or, like, what would happen if they had both? It's just one of those things that it's How to like, Train Your Dragon too. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's one of those things that you're just like, all right, we'll like, again, that. here we go. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. But, again, with that, I know we didn't do Frozen on Anatomy of a movie, but Frozen tried to sort of, like, play that whole orphan thing, and I just think they crashed and burned but that's a whole nother discussion we can get into. Um, I'm just in, I was just in, intrigued that the writers decided to go there when introducing her family. I can understand mm -hmm. why you bring that up, but because we had that reoccurring theme that there's a, a parent missing in the main one of the main characters storyline that it still didn't bother me even though we've seen it a million times. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it hindered anything of her character development throughout right. this movie. I, I agree with that. I just would like to you challenge the writers. <laughs> I want to challenge them and see. It's like I'm putting this on new. my list of things that you've done. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so we had it up. we had Jules' fun family c coming together, and then we also had the the villains from the first movie kind of come back. Nigel, in particular, <laughs> we see Nigel. He is now grounded. He has he has lost the ability to fly, but he still has that revenge mm -hmm. storyline going out for Blue. Do we think it was needed to bring the same villain back? I don't think that Nigel was necessarily the most needed component of this film. I think that this is a kids film though in general and having him not die is a little bit understandable yeah yes um but what i loved is that it gave rise to the two other supporting characters he brought in yes i mm -hmm. loved that he brought in the poison frog and i love that he brought in the anteater because <laughs> i thought that they were so much fun um i think that poison channel's number was one of the it was a very different musical number but it very much stole part of the show oh yeah it was a very ursula type it was, number it was very interesting we'll get more into the music because i yeah. really want to talk about yeah that. visually just so i like that nigel provided the foundation for that and because you kind of we have a villain who's a human but in the real world and the humans and the animals don't communicate mm -hmm. so you need to have a villain that can communicate and that was kind of put in between nigel and the scarlet macaws where they're kind yes. of like the anti yes. So, Ube. do I think that this movie like would have crashed and burned if Nigel wasn't there? No. But I do think that it added some benefits to the film. And I think that if you made the only bad character the human, then it wouldn't have worked. I Because there's no crossover. I agree. Except I think they, I think they should have chosen either having the Scarlet macaws in there as you know the complete villain and i think that could have been its own storyline because i do think there needed to be an animal villain otherwise i think the dad would have become the villain mm -hmm. i think it would have been too much in there and you don't you want them to not get along at first you want there to be tension but you don't want it to be that the main conflict mm -hmm. and you don't want it like you said to be just the main conflict with the humans there needs to be a dual level one when there's the animal human relationship i almost and i did love Kristen Chenoweth's frog. I think that was amazing. I really wish they just would have figured out a way to put it into the Scarlet Macaws. Mm -hmm. Put that type of character in there and then had it be like this red versus blue Scarlet Macaws kind of territorial thing. Or like and then the they Scarlet come Macaw that fell in love with blue. Yeah. Like <laughs> something. Or like maybe fell in love with the dad. Maybe Juliet. that's how the dad got the mom. You know, something like that. But to where and then at the end they all joined together to fight the humans as one would have been a really nice storyline. Um, I just think that having all of these different ones floating around didn't help to bring the film together. Um, 
But it, yeah, it was great. That anteater named Charlie, you know, going off the Charlie Chaplin Charlie thing was really hat. cute. And yes. a silent character as well. Yes. And I thought that was really fitting because his name was Charlie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he did so much. He, it the was, tongue. The tongue. It was How incredible. How hysterical. All the uses of the anteater's <laughs> yes. tongue. I thought that was just a nice way to keep his c- character keep going with the the funny elements throughout. Yeah, definitely. it was almost as if they had so many writers on this film that came up with such great ideas. They just didn't want to throw anything away because they were all so developed. Having that anteater and all of the movements he did is such a Charlie Chaplin thing. Mm-hmm. All of Charlie's dancing, body the, the work. The way he and, danced with the cane. I'm yeah. Like, it's definitely Charlie Chaplin. And then Kristen Chenoweth's entire character. I mean, that one storyline was so well developed. You, re- I really think that they just had so many great writers coming up with such great work that they just it did the best they could to piece it together to make it one film. But it was a little much. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, because we can kind of go into that way where's where's the line between it being understandable to overwhelming and i think again they did that great balance because also adding gabby's love story with nigel Mm -hmm. added the element why she's still there and why she's sticking around yeah they needed that justification (laughs) for why and why she was willing to poison a bunch of birds <laughs> she didn't know yes yeah. like they it was supported it was supported yeah Very and supported. he was nigel was really the only animal that was completely evil mm-hmm. so it was nice not having gabby be completely evil like she's just totally in love and i think that was a really great way to just yeah only have one really completely evil person and then one really completely evil human and who didn't you didn't really connect with which was fine yeah and i also love that the human that was completely evil was also addicted to sugar I think that was its own storyline in itself, like the killing the rainforest and being addicted to sugar, all mm-hmm. all little things. But again, showing that human Love quality that, and maybe a weakness in in in, in, in villain, uh, mm-hmm. a human villain. Yeah. Character. But mm-hmm. I loved how because we are in a new location, so to say. I mean, we're in the same country, obviously, but we're in a big vast force Mm -hmm. and we have so many colors and vibrancy and so many different characters that we're talking about and animals that we're seeing because we also see boa constrictors sloths oh yeah ant eaters piranhas so just bringing the whole brazilian animal kingdom into it was really fun i really yeah and i think they did a great job doing that in the audition scenes you know we got to Mm -hmm. see all of these animals perform these really fun songs and dances And we got to see the animal kingdom itself, like what eats what and all the, like how tough it is out there and how all these city boys, you know, are kind of freaking out. Yeah, it was amazing. I think it was just, that was one of the most fun scenes. When I was walking out of the theater, I actually heard someone say, oh, you went to the bathroom at the, like the best part. It was so funny. It was the audition scene. So I think everybody really enjoyed seeing all of those characters brought in. I just liked it when the black, uh, jaguar or yeah. whatever it was like ate the little guy and it was just that memory voice coming out and to me that showed the skill of animation oh yeah because you can tell when voices don't fit mm-hmm. and the fact that like and that pointed it out to me really was just how well everyone else's voice matched that it no one felt weird like no other character's voice didn't match mm-hmm. its look besides that one and that's what that <laughs> seemed not only was it funny and commented on the animal kingdom and like what it's what but also i was just like can you imagine if they cast all the voices wrong like how Mm -hmm. off it would feel for the whole film because that's what that showed that's what that showed me at least and i was also wondering if they had written the script like the reason why there were so many parts is if they had originally written it not knowing they were going to get all the characters back but because everybody like signed on to come back again which i think is pretty rare for animation especially for a sequel Mm -hmm. to get all these huge names to come back i bet they're like oh we really have to use all these now (laughs) yeah and it also and i heard in an uh, interview with uh, jamie fox and will i am who who voices nico and pedro they the two lovable birds that their characters there's they've exhausted all of their resources in Rio because they're, they're so used to performing together and whatnot. So going, they agreed to go on their journey to the Amazon to get that fresh, all those fresh voices in for their big performance for Carnival. But that also leads back to 
just the culture of mm. Rio and because it all leads back to Carnival, that the thing that everyone loves. So even the animals and the humans can join together <laughs> in that overall bond. Gotcha, that makes sense. Yeah, so I, I think that that's another fun element of bringing different voices in, even if it was for one or two seconds, but uh, the sloth. I'd have yes. to say the sloth was my favorite. I always laughed when the sloths, e- even though it was the same joke of her like coming out rapping and then going back to sleep immediately, that one joke was just enough. It was every time you came back to her, it was still funny. Yeah, and uh, actually the, the voice of the sloth, uh, I'm, I'm Sorry, I'm trying to find her name on my notes. Uh, Amy Heidemann. She is oh. actually a YouTube sensation who started a band. And then they, uh, th- she was discovered in that way. And they brought her character to bring... Because as we know, sloths are slow-moving animals. Very, very mm-hmm. stoic-like. And then to really change up that stereotypical belief that they're like they're not fun they're not interesting and to have that fun animated rapping fast pace we wouldn't expect it Mm -hmm. which i think was more memorable from just a simple animal yeah yeah absolutely i think she's the one i can't think of their band's name but it's her and another guy right yes and another guy um i I can picture their youtube videos she got famous for doing Nicki minaj's voice yes which is interesting because the sloth was very much like Nicki minaj yes um i think wasn't it singing a Nicki minaj song yeah i just wonder if they tried to get Nicki minaj and then they couldn't and then they were like oh we'll get you well you can do it (laughs) yeah (laughs) but you know what you do it on youtube i didn't mind that no i I didn't didn't at all so uh you might I want to talk about the music. Yes, let's. And the, I'm really excited about this segment because, we, as we know, Rio, the fir- first one, we had some singing and dancing. But being in Rio and Brazil, that whole culture is known for samba and dance and celebration and really embracing that performing aspect mm-hmm. of it. They really brought it to life in the second film. And not just with samba, but with also bringing the different cast members we had bruno who's known for pop and we had kristen chenoweth known for broadway and then they also brought in janelle monet an r&b artist we had will i am you know big big characters and then of course we had the music producers uh Car- carlinos brown who is a well-known brazilian songwriter music producer and then we had the returning sergio mendez who worked on the first film And then also John Powell, Mm -hmm. which I thought was also an interesting mix to that because he's an English composer. And the reason why he they brought him in because they wanted the outside perspective, because most of the main composers on this film are know really a lot about the Brazilian culture, but they wanted an English perspective to keep everyone else who doesn't know Brazilian to keep them interested. Oh, to bring that uh, aspect of how do you keep the music fun and entertaining for someone who doesn't know the Brazilian culture. I even like that they made the little samba joke that Blue didn't like samba because it constantly, it sounds the same and it's just tick tock, tick tock. And then he, you know, embraces it in the end, which I think is just a perfect example of what someone who didn't grow up listening to samba music would do. You know, at first, of course, it all sounds the same. And then when you really get it in your body and you get to dance it and perform it, that's when you get to like learn it and love it. And especially with samba i think i don't know i just watching this whole film and watching the animation of the animals dancing and from the first one as well in the carnival scene you really saw it just the big group numbers and the big group numbers with the birds were beautiful and i want i want to go to rio to just experience that because i know that it it really is like that there i agree i think that one of the scenes that stole the show for me was when they had the Blue Macaws do their family mm-hmm. song. And they all, and not only in the animation, great, where they got to distinguish the males and females using, like, the yellow yes. and the red and how visually they did that. But, like, that's a lot to put up to be, like, we're about to sing our song, our family song. It needs to, like, live up to that hype. Mm-hmm. And that song really did. it. You just felt the vibes of the family. You felt the, their essence through that song. And I think that musically they captured that moment and that scene perfectly yes and i i watched a very interesting interview with will i am and he was talking about 
a conversation that he had with Ser- uh, Sergio, the, the music producer. And Sergio broke it down of how Brazilian music is different from all the other surrounding countries, which I thought was brilliant. And I'm, I'm going to reiterate most of it because it really broke it down and, and how I understand how people appreciate uh, their music in Rio. Because if you think about it, the Americans, the French and Spanish and Brazil, Brazil they all had slaves mm-hmm. at one point in their lives. And then, so the slaves, they had music. and But at certain points, the the uh, Brazilian, with the slaves, they took away the guitar, but they had the drums. And then with the Latino culture, Central America, they took away the drums, but had the guitar. And that's why Latino music has a lot of guitar Yeah, a lot of picking, especially. Mm-hmm. And for the American culture, they took away the guitar, but we had the singing. And the s- same with French, they also took away the guitar. And then with African descent, they had the drums. But when they took the drums away from Africa, they that's when the, um, the, the, the singing, the chanting, yeah became involved so that's the the distinct the distinct how it's been between like different countries and the origins so but when we brought for the americans when we brought the guitar back into it that's when blues came along that's when jazz came along and for and so brazil has when they had the drums and that's where we get the beats mm-hmm. and the jungle sound like and then they they incorporated the african chant so that's where the singing comes involved and then they also had the latino guitar progression and so i thought that the inter that the mix of all those three things in the brazil music is amazing and i thought that was fascinating and blew my mind yeah that's really great that's i mean and that's where the capoeira style of dance comes from as well it's a fight style mm-hmm. and they uh they used it as a dance style because when this it was it's a it's a comes from the slaves kind of dancing but really practicing always practicing fighting always practicing fighting but making it look like a dance to you know trick their owners Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's incredible even to see it not only in a dance form because that's where tap comes from as well yes um in the americas uh was also from the slaves and yeah being taken away and needing you know like needing to express themselves in a way and so I think that's really incredible that Sergio Mendez was able to translate that into the film too it's and, beautiful and the the understanding of Brazilian music now and then bringing that into a family fun film and because when we hear it as an audience we think it's just fun music but when you understand the origin uh origins of where everything is coming from makes you appreciate it even more and then uh they also sergio also mentioned that there's a lot of percussive instruments percussions the drums there there i believe will i am mentioned a drum that he was using during the music recording sessions that it's called a quirka it's a type of drum but they used a lot of percussion instruments to mimic the the sounds of the jungle oh i definitely heard that with when the birds were dancing, you could hear there was a specific drum that they would use for each time they would flap their wings as a dance mm-hmm. move. And because of that, the movement seemed so connected to the music. It was exactly. so beautiful. It even helped you visualize it better. Yeah. And so, and then we also did mention the, the different types of genres that are mixed into this, especially Kristen Chenoweth's mm-hmm. musical number. Mm-hmm. I, I did enjoy this number. My only thing was that this was very standalone. It, I felt it was somewhat maybe out of place, but it was still enjoyable because we know Kristen Chen, great performer, great voice, mm-hmm. great singer, and her number was the most different from all the other numbers in this. Film. I would say well, very I think operatic. Hers Broadway. definitely was different, as well as um, Nigel's. Yes, I will survive. I will survive. They had their, but I would say that their two songs were very much a focus that was your more musical part of the movie than yeah. your soundtrack part and we got a little bit of that with jewel as she's saying like you know 16 bars of a lullaby to her kids mm-hmm. but other than that like those were they did stand out 
because overall i would say that this is a soundtrack movie more than a musical movie musical movies are like the characters are singing their lines are singing their plots and that was what, ha- what happened for Kristen chenoweth's character the frog and that's what happened for nigel where they were very they were talking out what they were going to do or singing out and i think it works for them for those two characters and i think it fits in the film because they were the evil characters you know they were already different so their songs have to be different and it would it worked for me it also worked for me because when we look at past animated films the ursula song is very very different than the rest of the little mermaid mm-hmm. even when you get into the lion king you know scar scar is all his stuff is very different so i think the all evil characters have to feel different in their songs because what happens is if you like their songs you might like them and you even see this in Les Mis if we really want to get into you know musical movies you never want to like the singing of the villain because when you like their singing you end up liking them yeah you want to appreciate and you want to Mm -hmm. like be able to know that it sounds good or that it's interesting but I feel like generally speaking It's like the song you take away. You want to be the song of success. You want it to be the love song. You want it to be the hero's song. Like you want it to be that big number. You you want it to be the thematic what people are supposed to take away. The theme of the movie. That song. And so you do have to differentiate. Give it a little that dark edge. Yeah, definitely the diff the where we can tell. Um, they're these are these type of characters. These are everyone else Mm -hmm. that you're supposed to love and but i think it's because maybe i've seen so many different kristen chenoweth performances by this time i saw this number in this music i was like oh that's kristen chenoweth just doing her thing yeah that's also i think that that's a very good point because i mean we both marissa and i both really really like musicals and like Mm -hmm. i've been listening to kristen chenoweth for years i was also listening to adina menzel for years Mm -hmm. and i saw them on broadway I saw them live. So when they do cross into animated films, they are one of those voices that they say one note. And I'm like, oh, I know who that is. And it is. It's a hard. It's a hard. But that's with any any animated voice, I think. I mean, how can you not know that's Jesse Eisenberg? You know, like it's going to come in and they're going to animate it for those people. So I think even though you're like, oh, that's Kristen Chenoweth. She's such a pop icon that if Michael Jackson were to do a voice, they're going to make it move like Michael. Because mm-hmm. that voice, when you hear that voice, yes. you hear those moves. When you hear Kristen's voice, she... It's very over. Yeah. And that's yes. what the character, they need to animate mm-hmm. that frog to be over dramatic. But it fits the frog's character. It fits the frog's storyline. So I think it totally works. I don't think it's you being like, oh, that's Kristen Chenoweth. You know, and it takes you out of the storyline. It doesn't at all. It adds to the storyline. So I think it's fine. If it's animated correctly, as you point yes. out. Yes. Versus yes. like... So nod to the you, animators for sure. If you put Kristen sure. Chenoweth's voice on a... Like Belle or something. Character, yeah. <laughs> It would not work. If you put, like, any big voice like that, if you put it on something that doesn't maintain that actor's presence, Mm -hmm. then you're going to be pulled out and you're going to be like, this character's unrealistic. They're not believable. And, like, when you're dealing with so many voices that are well-known, Jamie Foxx, Andy Garcia, Andy Garcia, like, you know what they look like. So it needs to be believable that if they were, in this case, a bird or whatnot or frog that is how they would be. Yeah, I think this was some of the best animation I've really ever seen, especially in that aspect. Tracy Morgan as the dog, I mean, the way Tracy Morgan speaks is unlike anybody else. Mm -hmm. And having him be this slobbery bulldog is brilliant. It's a medical condition. Yeah, and just (laughs) honestly, I think this is like thinking about it and how big of a personalities and how much we know these people in our culture And being able to animate them is, they did such a good job. I really think these animators can animate anything. Well, um, let's get into kind of, it's Blue Sky Studios. And we talked about Mm -hmm. how they did Ice Age. Yes. And on top of it, I was looking into them because I just, I think that so many people are like, oh, they're new, like Rio and Ice Age franchises. But these people have been animating and are so smart and have been doing it for so long. Um, they were doing started off as visual effects in movies like like Fight Club, 
oh wow graphic. so they've always been in this game and then from that developed that they weren't all just going to do visual effects they were going to expand and do their own stories and that was presented by they did a short um called like mr bunny or the bunny or something that was oscar nominated and won and it was like they've always been on the cutting edge they've always been on the cutting edge of computer graphics creating the technologies expanding these programs and i think that they have such a talented team that is not only technically able to do this, but they're also creative and create very impactful storylines. So I think we have a lot to see from Blue Sky. They've been around for a while, but I think I think they're coming. right up there with Pixar. Honestly, oh, they're yeah. they're making great stuff. I think the great thing with Blue Sky, they can really uh, portray and convey the characters and mm-hmm. how they are supposed to. Um, you know, act and relating to the actors who voice them. Because I'm thinking uh, another movie that they just did recently, Epic, also mm-hmm. by Blue Sky. And watching that in the characters in that movie, I mean, we had Beyonce's voice in that mm-hmm. movie, but her character was exactly what I pictured Beyonce. So, like, they have the great talent of conveying their actors within characters. Mm-hmm. And they also, I think that they must have an ability to you know edit themselves and redo because i i was looking at blue sky and there's so many steps in animation like it's so much funny it's so many times redoing or creating different versions like you're not editing different films together you actually have to create them you're not going to find any moments you have to draw each or animate each one and on top of that i think that with rio 2 they had to it shows the passion of blue sky where they will have auditions for people in their team to make the temporary voices before the (laughs) actors come in so they audition them and then they they're doing it themselves and then they're willing to though step back and be like okay actor come in let's readjust to like as you mentioned for bruno mars Mars. he was different than what the animators had thought but they were willing to be like okay Although we spent hours and hours and hours on this, we're going to redo and reapply. And then you end up with a great picture because they have that willingness to change. Yeah, and exactly. And going back to Bruno Mars, because now we see Roberto with his hand wave and his sleek hair, the long hair over his head. That was also Bruno Mars's interpretation of how Mm -hmm. his character was like. But so to be willing to take their their own talents consideration of what the characters should be like is a testament to them and how well they want characters to be portrayed. And Mm -hmm. I think it was a really smart move too because I think if Roberto's character would have been just that macho guy, it would have been like a lot of other animated stories we've seen. So Bruno Mars being smart enough to bring in like, oh, he's going to be that type that does you know, does the trills up and down and keeps going. That part was so funny. And you immediately, as an audience member, you knew, oh, this guy is totally full of himself. And we, yeah. and it, but it was like that different because you're right. We didn't get the big puffed out Robin's chest uh-huh. version. We got the sleek, you know. Yeah, almost surfer dude a little bit. Although there was that one moment where he was like flexing his pec muscles. Yes. Which was very kind of macho but Mm -hmm. but you can see where the animators had originally planned and then where they you know were flexible with bruno but i i actually am really glad they were flexible because it just made rio 2 different than other animated films where we could have been guessing of course the military dad likes him he's you Mm -hmm. know exactly like the dad and this kind of made him just a little bit different exactly and also adding the Brazilian culture into this the whole soccer game yes football Phil oh, you would have really it. enjoyed if you don't like animal movies but definitely watch this one just for the soccer because Phil is a humongous soccer or football yeah. fan <laughs> and we've been watching a lot of soccer games here at the studio so it's it's more in my head right now but I thought this whole scene was phenomenal how we had the, the fun button because I thought they they said this is war. Yeah. Like, how are you going to show a war in a kid's film? I got concerned. And then when they brought it down to a sport, because it does become a war in that country. It oh, is absolutely. Such, it is a humongous thing. It's what brings everyone together mm-hmm. as well. I've been and a fan of that. Brazilian football specifically since I was five. Just because the culture of Brazilian football is so strong 
that somehow being a five-year-old I had a Brazilian football jersey the yellow with their flag like I have that jersey and it's just crazy to think how did that even happen like I didn't have a USA soccer jersey no no no. I had a Brazilian football jersey and it's a thing it is such a big part of that culture so to have a movie called Rio, you got to have it. You have to have football. And I thought it was so much fun to see the two different Macaws team going up against each other mm-hmm. and just how they how they act like normal teams would that that <laughs> that human rivalry that yeah. we love to play off. Plus of. the announcers were amazing. That was another yes. great character to have just the hilarious Marco announcers. Marco Antonio Regil. Uh, who who's the actor who voiced the the announcer but he's also a big tv broadcasting i'm not surprised um, he was perfect (laughs) yeah and i thought they portrayed his character in he because he's a fan of sports as well so he brought that enthusiasm into the report because if you think about it soccer because we've been watching a lot of soccer lately the the commentary is so passionate and so emotional they get so involved in the game where when you go to any american sport there's the commentaries are supposed to be unbiased yes you have to be very professional and not show bias towards one team or another and so you have that lack of somewhat you kind of get that lack of enthusiasm or like passion yeah you, you have to not root for a specific one but when you come to football in Brazil and this culture, they're so into it. And so that vast difference is fun to watch. I think that visually this scene was stunning it's and amazing. it was fun. And like, obviously, as you guys pointed out, you need to have the soccer. What I like that they changed about it was that this wasn't the high point for Blue. What I liked yeah. that they didn't turn it into soccer is the most important thing. He has to win it highlight for blue he's accepted into the family but they still resided in the fact that saving the forest was more important and would end up really bringing them together versus this war of a game that's very fun and very entertaining to watch but underneath it the heart of the movie still has to be on the bigger battle yeah and i think that's such a good point because they didn't take the easy way out Mm -hmm. the writers and the animators did not take the easy way out and have him score the winning goal instead they sort of made him this anti-hero And he scored for the other team. And this was just another thing that Blue Mm -hmm. couldn't do right. And he was trying so hard. And soccer, the one thing he knows he's good at and he knows he can do. And he still didn't do it. And it was his relationship with Linda, his relationship with humans, that ended up saving the whole forest. Mm -hmm. And that it was his original, you know, his original storyline came back into place of, no, I'm a bird that's human-like. And that's how we're going to win is – because you guys aren't, you guys are afraid of humans. Like that was just so great. And mm-hmm. so it really made the whole film a nice circle and it rounded it out. Yeah, you have to think like humans to go up against humans. And I, I think that's great for, uh, to bring the humanistic quality that kids might not understand, but to, because the, you, you see animals act a different way. I mean, for Finding Nemo, that was really all animals mostly. I mean, we got one or two human beings. But it was mostly animals. Mm-hmm. But at the end of that movie, we see the the fish working together against the humans. And then now, in this, we had the birds working together against the humans. Mm-hmm. And I thought they brought that element. Um, and they, they showed that pretty well. Um, another another person that I just want to throw out there, uh, the... Um, not, not actor, but the talent, the the voice of Natalie Morales, who, who is a today's news anchor. She she did the voice of the news anchor in oh yeah this, in in the movie who was broadcasting the story at the beginning mm-hmm. that set everything off. Um, she is actually in person. She's half Brazilian as well. Oh, that's great! So so many Pulling people from all the talent they can. Yeah, yeah so great. many people who still had the original ties to just the culture of everything in this. It film. really makes a difference, I think. And I think the animators animated the Brazilian people in such a great and distinct and really honest way, you know. And it really, you really felt like, yeah, that is like because in Brazil, what's really interesting, and in South America especially, is because of you know all the colonization and all these things there are many races and you really actually did see that on the beach and in all those human scenes you see all the different races that make up a brazilian person and i think that was just really awesome and beautiful and cool to see and 
just that the animators would take the time and think that, mm-hmm. you know, like we, they have to be that specific. And the specificity of Rio 2 is, I think, what ended up making it such a great film. Yeah, and all the things that they thought of before that we wouldn't, we would just easily glide over or the fact that how they cleanly uh show the ending fate of the the human villain the big boss yes uh, he was <laughs> at the beginning of the movie we hear the quick line that boa constrictors that can swallow things whole and then mm. bringing that that's like that foreshadowing element to this is how the the villain ended he got swallowed by the boa and nature beat out the humans too i think is another theme that was kind of mm-hmm. yeah that 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 says is you know even though we're we are humans and we have all these machines and these toys and that can be very destructive that you know nature is pretty destructive on her own, own. Yeah. yeah now we obviously enjoyed the film so much how does everyone else enjoy it? How's it doing in the box office? So box office, Mercer has a budget. It was about 103 million. 103 million budget. Yes. And as of now, domestic total is at about 53 million. But where it's really getting some of its money is foreign. And it's worldwide is 177 million. Wow. That's so, great. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's gone over budget. Like It's made all its job. money back. Yay. And, I think- and you're bringing us outside of the american that the, the mm. whole story takes place outside of america but to bring that american understanding to it you, you get all these demographics involved uh, and we were talking about a little bit before the other wonderful thing about animation is that you can change out the voices to broaden like the languages this can be in which to me is so interesting because as we we talked about these fit the American voices so well. Mm-hmm. I wonder how in other languages it is perceived. If it's still, if everyone's fitting as well. Like think about Kristen Chenoweth. She's one of the most distinguishing voices, and she really impacts her character in this. Yeah. Like who are they finding to compete with that? Oh, I'm sure they. I'm sure they found some amazing. Oh, oh they did. Amazing um, Spanish actress who could really do it. But what's interesting is because it's in Rio. First and foremost, they have to do it in Portuguese. Yes. And what I love about this film is anytime a non-American is speaking or anytime a new animal comes in, they are immediately speaking Portuguese. And then they are like, oh, you're you're a, you're a tourist. You're out of town. So then they go into English, which was really very nice mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it just felt real. It felt like you really were in Rio. And, but yeah, so, you know, they do Portuguese. I'm sure they dubbed it in Spanish. Um, because they're, I bet the entire Latin American market, because this film was done so well with such great specificity, they all can really enjoy it knowing that their culture was like represented well in this American film. And also, uh, because I know they had to dub it in Portuguese. I, I'm sorry, I forget the, the name of the, the actor who they had, um, dubbed the voice of the, the father, the, the blue McCall, but he's Andy actually- Garcia? Um, yeah, Andy Garcia, but uh, for the Portuguese dub, they had a famous um, Brazilian actor do the voice. And also we had um, that, I'm sorry, I'm completely blinking on his name, that uh, Tulio's, the Tulio's mm. character, uh-huh. the, the actor who plays him. Uh, he is a well-known actor in Brazil. I mean, we, we've seen him mostly in 300 and a lot of American Uh, Mm -hmm. films too but he has a humongous following in Rio because that's where he's from and so just to use so many actors for both is awesome and just that that goes to show just like how amazing the industry is and how it can really just cover so many things cool yeah so uh but what were your reception to uh the reception to this film what kind of environment do you watch it in I think that what it's interesting. Theater like well, more of like going into what Rio one was, what Rio two is. I think that there's been so much comparison comparing this. Like people are like, oh, sequels. It can never be as good as Rio one. And I loved the first Rio. I think that this one was still fun. Um, I saw it really late at night, so it wasn't the most packed theater because mm-hmm. I think that this is a you know, it's for kids. Yeah. This is one of those movies you see on the weekend. You see you bring your whole family to. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't actually get to have that experience. But that was just because we're, when I chose to see it. Um, overall, I think it's a very fun movie. I think that it's something that I think if I would bring like, you know, my, my cousins, my little cousins too. Um, reception wise, I understand why people are like, 
oh, it's different than Rio 1. Because Rio 1 was unexpected. It was a really big turn. We had never seen anything before. And you're getting a franchise, so you are going to get some repeats. So it's not going to be as shocking as mm. the first one. Um, But I still really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think I saw the th- movie uh, at a matinee, so there were tons of kids. So it's really, I love seeing kid movies when there are kids because... The writers of animated films nowadays do such a great job of playing jokes for kids and jokes for adults. So I think sometimes when you see an animated film with just adults, you might miss the parts that all the kids think Mm -hmm. are really funny. And I think those are really great parts. And they're mostly the animated parts. They're the less chatty parts. They're the physical action. Yeah. Um, so it was really fun to see it in a the theater of kids and hear them laughing and screaming and, you know, ooing and aahing and kids always make noise when they think something. So it's fun to see what they're reacting to. And I personally really enjoyed the film. I thought it flew by. Sometimes sequels, you know, can be a little slower because they are a little plot heavy. They have to explain what happened in the first one, you know, kind of and like tie up all the loose knots and then get into the new story. But I think it moved really fast. I think that they were able to pull in all of the new storylines well. I think, you know, it could have been done a little bit better, but overall, a great, fun film. Really enjoyed it. And I would go see a third one if they made it. <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, the the actor's name is Rodrigo Santoros, who does the voice of Tulio. He, oh. He's well known in Brazil as well. Um, I went at a 7 o'clock screening on a Saturday, so I was filled with a bunch of kids. I had kids on both sides of me. <laughs> and... But the the there was laughter throughout, and it kept the the tone and the atmosphere what it should be like, and I enjoyed it. And the I think the one of the moments that got the biggest laugh out of everyone, the adults and kids included, and myself, I even laughed out loud, uh, was when the jaguar swallowed yes. the the, the mm-hmm. other animal, and then we had the small Broadway voicing in memory. That was hysterical, and definitely a standout moment for me that I just remembered. Mm-hmm. Um, throughout that, that was really fun. I I loved this movie. I loved Rio, and I'm looking forward because when they were doing the sequel in talks of the sequel, that was really early on, and we know that Carlos, um, the the director, is signed on with Blue Sky for another five years. He has a five year contract. Oh. So if they did a sequel or a, a third movie, he could definitely be part of that as well. And I think if they did a third one. They should line it up with the 2016 Olympics. Oh, timing yes. In Rio. Oh, I'm sure per- they're thinking that. Two years. Perfect timing. They're like, lining yes. it up right now with the World Cup. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The second one, the this one just came out in April, uh, April 11th. And the FIFA World Cup it's premieres in June. Yeah. So, so but, and so if and they had the third one And usually we get films out, first. So I bet yeah. it'll come out in Brazil right around World Cup time and I bet it'll good you planning know, yeah be distributed throughout the rest of the world right around June because usually usually the U.S. gets all the films first although yeah. as we said like they are getting a lot of numbers yeah worldwide which is awesome which is great so I think the when and if the third one comes out it should definitely be around the summertime when the real Olympics are going on yeah because the real will be on everyone's mind it's the perfect I'm sure platform the DVD is coming out then <laughs> yeah perfect <laughs> the time DVD to and promote. Blu-ray <laughs> But okay, so overall, I love this film. Uh, the cast members, you can just see all of them together when they're talking about it. They were so excited to jump back on board, and not one of them had any hesitation to say, no, I don't want to do it again. They all were one. And in another interview, Anne Hathaway said she personally loves the soundtrack, that she was just listening to it in the car out of pure enjoyment. Absolutely. And I, the, the soundtrack is actually available. It was released on March 25th by the Atlantic Records. So it is available uh, to to purchase, I'm sure, everywhere, as long with this podcast. And yeah. great film. We're going to be covering more kids' films in the future. We have How to Train Your Dragon 2 coming out. I'm so excited to do that. But in the meantime, where can we all follow you to do more talk discussions and dissections of film? Well, guys, definitely follow me at anatomymovie.com. You can comment, write, post us questions. We have another segment that we're going to be doing where we're going to answer you guys. So make sure, leave us your comments. Let us know what you think. This is all about getting the conversation going about movies. And I hope you enjoyed Rio. Yeah, you guys can find... you. Please, please go on Anatomy of a Movie and comment because we do have a whole separate show that you'll be able to find online where we 
get back into that. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chloe West X. And I also do The Voice and So You Think You Can Dance after show for After Buzz TV. Yes, and we all do after shows. Our sister network for After Buzz TV. Definitely check that amazing network out. Follow all of us on Twitter at Movie Anatomy. We're going to be doing a bunch of dissections in the future. It's the, I'm, I'm just like enjoying this music right now. But it's, it's so fun. Uh, great family film. Definitely take your kids to go see it. To have it in adults, it's great for adults yeah. as well. I mean, and I, it's a family film I feel for we sure. fit in the, the middle. We're the mi- young yeah. adults. <laughs> so it covers everything. Laughter, fun, dancing, everything you would love in a family film. So thank you all for listening, and we will see you all for our next movie dissection. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie. Thanks for watching Anatomy of a Movie on YouTube. For more on your favorite movies, subscribe to our channel here, and be sure to let us know what you think in our comment section below here. Bye.